Wow. I, uh, I haven't seen your room since Eric fixed it up for you. What do you think? Who's that? Wayne Grisky. Who's that? Wayne Grisky. I'd like to go to bed now. Okay, you don't need anything from your, um, from your bags downstairs? No, I think I have all my necessary toiletries in here. Okay. Well, uh, bathroom is downstairs on the second floor, and we're just opposite if you need anything. Sam? Yeah? How long do you think I'm going to be here for? I called Billy, I left a message, and I think by the time he flies up here, maybe a couple of weeks? Well, I guess. Good night. Gardenia. It's a kind of flower. What you doing with hand cream? Thank you very much for coming by today to talk about your work and your life. Uh, you're generally regarded very highly as a producer. You're also a writer uh, and an actor. And so you've had a diversity of experience. I'd love to start at the beginning and uh, find out a little bit about where you were born and where you grew up. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I lived there until I was six. and then. Far Rockaway, Long Island, New York, and uh, lived there until I was around uh, 19, and then I went to medical school in Philadelphia, and then uh, I left medical school when I was 21, moved to New York City, Manhattan. Uh, my parents are Israeli. Uh, they are both seventh generation born in Jerusalem. When they came to the States as youngsters in 1929, they became what essentially became modern Orthodox. So I was brought up and went to yeshivas. Hebrew and Zionism and um, Israeli culture was the thing that was the hallmark of my growing up. So I have a Hebrew name, Tzvi, which a lot of people, what's my real name? Yes. Um, and uh, which means dear in um, English, D-E-E-R, which in Hebrew and Yiddish is a Herschel. And one day when I was a little kid, um, people made fun of, they couldn't pronounce the name Tzvi or they made fun of me. I guess I was probably not the most masculine of kids. And uh, they called me Twee or, you know, when we came home crying we went to my mm. mother. Sure. My mother was an immigrant, Palestinian immigrant essentially, and said, you know, let's call you, we can't call you Herschel, we'll call you Howard. And so that's how Howard happened. And then years later when I came out to Hollywood, I became a kind of glad-handing party kind of guy. I um, made money easily in the early years and uh, went, <laughs> had a good time. And um, in 83, as the world got darker with AIDS um, and I stopped my wicked ways, um, I essentially felt that I was more like the nerdy little kid that I was when I was a kid. And I kind of put those two personas together, the glad-handing guy and the nerdy little kid. And I, I, I changed my name back to my original name. Essentially, I wanted my mother to see, before she died, I wanted her to see my name on the screen, my real name, Svi Howard Rosamund. When my mother was uh, very ill in, in 2001, she handed me a letter. And the letter said, um, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Rosenman, your brilliant young son, Svi, is in the throes of a homosexual crisis. It's incumbent upon you to send him to a psychiatrist or psychoanalyst to determine whether he has enough heterosexual fabric to make a heterosexual adjustment or whether he's truly homosexual, yours truly. And this is 30 years before the APA undesignated homosexuality as an illness. That's, that's a pretty interesting it was, letter. Yes, it's a very interesting letter. My mother handed it to me because my parents were never happy with the fact that I was gay. They accepted me unconditionally, Yes, but they were generationally much older and they were also immigrants. And they it was were also very hard for that group of very people. Very hard, you know. 
what I got out of the whole thing years later was um, I had a boyfriend and my parents came out to California by this time and my boyfriend had very, very long hair and was a very, very masculine guy and had a beard. And um, uh, my father expected me to be at his Friday night table. He, he was out living with my brother. My nephew was just born. And um, I brought my, my, my father said, I want you here for Friday night, you know, for Shabbat. And I, well, I'm not going to leave my boyfriend home, so I brought him. Sure. And my father was like amazed. He couldn't, he couldn't wrap his brain around, you know, he was looking at me and my boyfriend. I'm sure I, I know what he was thinking. And, but the guy was so butch, you know, and this was very disturbing to my father. But, and eventually what happened, uh, it blew up and we went to this wonderful rabbi who had just died, Levy Mayer, he's Spielberg's rabbi. Yes. A, and he wears a, uh, a crocheted uh, kippah, and, uh, which means it's a signal that they're modern Orthodox and Zionist. And my father was able to relate to this guy. Mm -hmm. And he explained to my father that the word in the Bible for abomination, you know, if a man lieth with another man, it is an abomination. Yes. The word is uh, to'eva. And the Bible that is written in, in, in letters without any punctuation, any dots. It's just letter after letter after letter. So it's just volumes of letters. And um, he parsed the word to'eva to be to'eba which means a mistake in the road. And my father was able to live with that. Hmm. And um, he was very nervous that I wouldn't have children. But at the time, this was 10 years ago, it was just starting out the, um, the uh, in vitro fertilization of uh, sperm and egg. And <laughs> I said, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they accepted me. They loved me fully and unconditionally. I got it. I had a volatile relationship with my father. The tougher he got with me, the tougher I got, you know. And eventually, you know, I was known when I was running big companies in Hollywood as a really tough boss. And uh, my father once came to the, one of my sets and he saw me in action and he said, How did you get so tough? He said to me. I said, Well, have you looked in the mirror lately? What was your mother? My like. mother was brilliant, uh, charismatic. I am uh, now a combination of them, but years ago I was more like my mother. She was very, very verbal and very, very um, smart, a very quick thinker, yes. and very beautiful she was. And um, she met my father when she was 14 and he was 18 at her older sister's uh, marriage to my father's older brother. And my father approached her. She was very developed. She was very beautiful. And she was very voluptuous. And uh, he was immediately attracted to her and asked her out. She was 14. And she said, I can't go out with you until I'm 18. And on her 18th birthday in May, May 25th, he called her. And uh, I think their first date was the Frank Sinatra concert in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Paramount in 1944. Then I had a sister that was born six years later. Um, and my mother had trouble uh, with, with each of our births. I have a brother who was also 20 years younger than both of us, same parents. Uh, my mother was 18 when she had me. Um, okay. well, yeah, she was 18. And um, so she was 37 when she had my brother. And um, uh, she was uh, quite something, my mother. Uh, volatile and dramatic and charismatic and funny. And she got me, my mother got me early, early on. Um, but she was troubled. Every time she had one of us, she had um, what they then called a nervous breakdown. Um, today, it's pretty obvious that it was PPD, Post, you know, yeah. postpartum depression. Yes. But she was out of commission for a year every single time each one of us my was goodness. born. Yeah. And that's why I remember my father took over the role of my mother when I was an infant. And my grandmother took care of me, too, who was a, uh, an austere woman, my father's mother. And um, my mother didn't have anything to do with us. It was my father that gave me all the tenderness. Mm -hmm. And then when, that, when he found out that I was gay when I was four, that stopped it. You know, he couldn't, and he was in denial about it. He was in denial about my gayness until my, my nephew was born. Were you precocious enough at four to see that difference? And, uh... Well, I knew that I was gay when I was four also, not only from that letter, but I remember as a youngster, as a four-year-old boy, we would go to beach clubs in Long Island, in Long Beach, in Atlantic Beach. Sure. And there were these old beach clubs that we used to go to, and the solariums of the men and the women 
were built with wood and there were cracks in the wood and you could look in and see the men and women parading around naked. And I always went to the men's solarium, but my friends all went to the women's solarium. So I knew, I already knew at four, five, and six that I was gay and different than all of the other kids of my class. And yeah. how did you feel about that? I felt like I was an outsider, you know. Yes. Um, and um, that sense of outsideness, you always have it, you know. Yes. So you always empathize. I always empathize. I, you know, I, when I was a kid growing up, I loved R&B. And every other kid in my class loved rock and roll. But I wanted to hear Stevie Wonder and Sam and Dave and, sure. you know, Otis Redding and, you know, all of that. And um, I was an anomalous little curly-haired Jewish boy in Long Island who loved black music. And it was like... What is wrong with this picture? My father couldn't understand it for the life of him. You see that throughout your career because <laughs> some of the movies you've done and your, yeah. your taste in different things. You know, black music, R&B specifically, is music of the church. It's music of, it's the music of uh, joy and the lyrics of oppression. And it's, you know, I will climb every mountain just to be with you, oh God, with the bittersweet knowledge that you could never cleave mm -hmm. to God, okay? It's always... A sadness about it, okay? Right. But there's the joy of the attempt to unite with the godhood. Yep. That um, music of the church, essentially, of the dialectic between the joy of the music and the rhythm and the lyrics of oppression, that dialectic creates the tension of R&B. Black female singers personify that to me. So I got into that, and it's what made me and Joel Schumacher make our first movie together, which was called Sparkle, about three black girls in Harlem in 1956. Curtis Sorry. Mayfield did the soundtrack for Sparkle, and Aretha yes. Franklin recorded it, you know, and um, that was a great experience for me, and gives me a lot of credibility in the black um, community, especially with singers. It's very interesting how, you know, one can be gay but have real strong religious principles, oh, and yeah. those things are not conflicting at all. You see, the Jewish religion has gradations of such narrow um, proportion. My, my sister, for instance, is ultra-Orthodox, and she lives in Jerusalem, and all my nephews wear black hats and black clothes. They're called blacks, black hats, mm. and they have side curls. They don't watch television, they don't go to the movies, they hardly read the newspapers or magazines. They're very, very sheltered from it, and they live a life that's quite um, xenophobic and narrow, although they're very happy. They have difficulty with me because I am such a uh, paradigm of the secular culture, of the gay secular culture specifically. Yes. Um, but I'm, I define myself as a gay Zionist, <laughs> essentially, is what I am. And, um, nothing wrong with that. That's a, what? Nothing wrong with that. That's a good way to be. Well, what happened was in May of 1967, Nasser blockaded the Straits of Tehran and um, choked off the southern half of Israel to any shipping. It was, in international parlance, a casus belli, which means a cause of war. And that was on May 5th of 67. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Utant, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations, removed 100,000 UN troops to the, that were on the border of the Negev of the Negev and the Sinai, and 100,000 Egyptian troops moved in. So Israel and the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Jordanians were all screaming for Jewish blood and saying they were going to destroy the entire Jewish nation. Well, it was a very scary time in the history books. It's called the tension in the Israeli history books. And so my cousin Arya, who's now a very famous Jungian analyst uh, in New York, uh, said to me, if war breaks out, we go. Well, on the evening of June 5th of 67, um, Israel preemptively, in the stealth of night, went around at, uh, south and then up again through Egypt and destroyed the entire Egyptian Air Force on the ground and destroyed the Syrian Air Force on the ground. And so I got on one of these planes that the Sikorskys and the Rothschilds were, were, were taking out seats and filling with spare parts and materiel for the army and got on one of those planes, landed in Israel. Um, and was through a cousin of mine and through another connection, I got placed in the uh, Gaza Strip, in the Rafa salient, Rafiach it's called, and I was uh, an extern there, which is an intern without a degree, yes. um, doing mostly triage and amputations. 
and um, on the third day of the war, Israel reconquered Jerusalem. My parents' family had been thrown out of the old city and had to move to the new city. And my father told me all these incredible stories about these Arabs with their jalabas, kafiyas, and the exoticness of the old city. And my father spoke fluent Arabic. My commanding officer knew that my family was seven generations and eight generations born in the old city. They were called the Ancients of Jerusalem, the Vatike or Shalayim. And so he allowed me to escort the troops into um, Jerusalem where Rabbi Gorin, who was the chief Ashkenazi rabbi, blew the ram's horn on the Temple Mount. And that was a very emotional experience for me. And I started to define myself as less of a Jew and more the way King David is described in Samuel. He was beautiful of figure, he knew how to play the lyre, and he was a man of war. Thirty days after the war, Leonard Bernstein came to conduct Mahler's Resurrection Symphony in the newly reconquered Man Scopus. The first thing he did was visit the volunteers. He came and he looked at me and he held my chin in his hands and he said, I know a boy just like you who was a waiter at a discotheque in New York. He was my waiter. And I answered in Hebrew that I was his waiter at this discotheque called Arthur. He kissed me on the lips and invited me to the concert. My parents um, had come in from uh, uh, America ready to pay many thousands of dollars a ticket and couldn't get tickets and I marched into the King David Hotel with four tickets. Where'd you get those tickets, my mother said to me. And I said, well, my Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> and Leonard was then 47, 48, and was a hero because he had advocated for the state of Israel in, 20, in 1947 when he was then the uh, head of the New York Symphony. And he was a big hero in Israel. It was like Mick Jagger. And I went to the concert with my parents and my cousin Rachel. And on the downbeat of the resurrection, with the old city in front of me and the new city behind me, my brain broke again into another billion fragments. And I've been spending all this time picking them up. Um, and Leonard at the party afterwards um, asked me if I would be willing to be a gopher on the documentary that they were making about him called Journey to Jerusalem. And I don't even know what a gopher was, but I figured what a great way to see the territories. And so I became his gopher. One night I went into his tent and had dinner with him and my life uh, forever changed. What kind of man was he? What was Genius, your... brilliant, uh, a, a true polymath, a person that had knowledge of so many different subjects in so much depth. He knew about geography and history and art and literature and music and, 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 and politics and history and sociology. It, he was so dazzling. So suddenly there I was with my hero um, being very close to me. Sure. and taught me a lot and changed my view of the world and indeed convinced me to leave medical school. Didn't really convince me actively, but he would say to me, you don't seem happy as a doctor. You, you, you're not going to be happy as a doctor. You've got to do what you love. When I was a kid, when I was 11, I remember going to the movie theater, the Pix movie theater of Farakwe, and I saw Gone with the Wind, and I came back and I said to my mother, who made that movie? And she said, Clark Gable and, and, and uh, uh, Vivian Lee. I said, no, 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 they didn't make the movie. They acted in the movie. Right. Who made the movie, I right. said to my mother. Who put and this my, together? This looks very complicated, right. all this stuff. Who made this movie? And so my mother did some research, and she explained to me the difference between a producer and a director. And I found out what a producer was, and I wanted to be a producer at the age of 11. Then I changed a little bit, and I thought I'd be an actor. And that was very not good in the kind of family that I grew up with. Although my mother did tell me years later that she, if I wanted to go to acting school, she would have gone, to, gone back to become a bookkeeper to make money for me mm. to do that. And so she was very supportive of that part of my personality. My father wasn't, you know. Um, but uh, eventually they, they came around and were, were very, very proud. But, you know, when I um, left medical school, and came out, uh, I told my father in one day that I was no longer religious, <laughs> that I was leaving medical school, and that I was gay. And I was on the way, funnily enough, there's a man named Baruch Goldstein. I went to school with him, the same yeshiva, the yeshiva flappers. And he eventually killed 19 Arabs by a machine gun in the cave of the patriarchs and wounded about 130. I was on the way to becoming that. Hmm. And had I not found a creative outlet for my 
deep feelings of wanting to be creative in some sort. That could have been me. And after you had spent this time with uh, Mr. Bernstein, what, what was the next step? Or how did you I came evolve to towards your eventual career? I came to New York. And the only person that I knew in the, in the entertainment field was Sybil Burton, who had, still had her discotheque. And she was married to a young man named Jordan Christopher. And they had a daughter together, actually. Um, she has a daughter with Richard named Kate uh, Burton, who's a great actress. Sure. Um, but uh, Jordan was a very good-looking boy. boy uh, but he was in a band that's a kind of mod guy. And um, he was doing a movie called The Tree that Bob Gannett was directing a black and white movie that Eileen Heckert and George Rose and Ruth Ford, this is Zachary Scott, were all in. And Jordan needed a driver. And I became the driver for about two months. Then I sold ties at Bloomingdale's. And then, through a friend of mine in New York, he, uh, he introduced me to a man named Michael Benthol, who was the head of Britain's National Theater. And I became Mr. Benthol's assistant. Then he introduced me to Miss Catherine Hepper, and he was going to direct Coco. And he, by this time, had said, why don't you become Miss Catherine's assistant, and I will hire another assistant, and then you can, have, you can see what it's like to work for a major star. And sure. I became um, Miss Hepburn's assistant. And I did that for a year, worked on Broadway. And what was that like? Because you have to understand, New York in 1968 was burgeoning, just exploding with creative energy. Gay people were just about feeling their oats, although there wasn't equality. And when you went dancing, there was a man on a ladder. And the only way you could dance together with another man was if there was a girl at the center and there were men ringing her. And you could all dance together. If you, two bodies got too close, there was the man on the ladder who beamed a flashlight at you. And if he beamed the flashlight at you three times, he would call the police. It's what provoked Stonewall. Because in 69, at the Stonewall bar, this happened. And so there was this feeling of, oh my god, you know, the, the, the pride of it, the uh, intensity of it. And New York was changing, because the social structure in New York was then collapsing. Because up until that time, up until 65, 66, the prevailing structure was what school you went to, whether you were in the social the social register, it was very WASP-oriented, it was right. very male, white, dominated. Well, everything was now breaking down. And out of, those, out of that breakdown came the Black Revolution, the Women's Revolution, and the Gay Revolution. There was this feeling of euphoria that had no ceiling when you went out. So from 68 to 79 in New York, one Stonewall happened, and then the law was overturned, and men could start dancing with each other. All hell broke loose. It was magic. It, to, to live in New York uh, during those years was magic. Uh, you know, I, had a, uh, I was out, and I had the time of my life. I then met a girl, actually, that I fell in love with, named Kitty Hawks, who was the daughter of uh, the great director Howard Hawks. It was a little confusing for me because I didn't know what I w was. I was in love with her, but... Well, she was a pretty unique yeah, sort. Yeah, she was very unique, very beautiful. And she was named the Girl of the Year because Halston used her as his inspiration. And she was always dressed in Halston dresses because I was her boyfriend and my sexuality was a little bit in question. Um, Women's Way Daily kind of always gossiped about it. And she was, uh, we were named the couple of the year in the New York Times. And her mother was Lady Keith, Slim Keith, um, who the character of Lauren McCall was patterned after in To Have and Have Not in the Big Sleep. And she discovered Lauren McCall actually yes. when she was Betty Persky. And this is all very glamorous for me, from a boy who came from a religious Jewish background, Farakway. I think that was a different time, and I think it was a different time of glamour. Yeah. It was a different sort of glamour than what you saw, you know, in the, the 30s and, and that yes. era, in the 40s. But, right. But it was pretty special and pretty was, different. I was having a blast. I mean, you know, it was just a blast. And at the time, what I was doing, after I worked for Miss Hepburn, I got a job, uh, 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 at Benton and Bowles, and I became an assistant producer. That's an advertising an agency? An advertising agency. And it was the time, it was a Procter & Gamble and General Foods agency. So it was very, very conservative. And I had masses of curls, you know. 
and I was this Jewish kid that was, you know, breaching the walls of the WASP establishment in that world, as was every other Jewish kid. With a bit of sexual ambiguity and... All of that. And edginess to All of that. In. And they liked it. And soon I began winning Cleo's. I began making commercials for Havilland Oil, for Cool Whip, for Cool and Creamy, for Prell, for um, uh, Vicks NyQuil, uh, for Pampers. Joel Schumacher and I did a version of Spanish Pampers. <laughs> Joel did the clothes. So he, he was there also. At the, I brought him in. At the, um, at the time. How did you meet him? I have a checkered history with him because I met him early on. Uh, I had a boyfriend, a Jewish boyfriend, a hot Jewish boyfriend, and we were walking up the street and I saw this guy coming down the street, and this was 1968, who was wearing a long camel's hair coat, long, long hair, a turquoise belt with a black turtleneck. And I said to my boyfriend at the time, who is that? And he said, that's Joel Schumacher. Stay away from him. <laughs> Naturally, um, that being said, I was constantly, you know, looking for Joel, and eventually I found him, and he was by that time, later on, uh, had gotten involved in drugs. I'm not saying anything out of school. Um, well, he's talked about that. Yeah. And then about six months later, we had a friend in Fire Island. Um, the guy actually was the drug dealer of Fire Island. His name was Sam Playa, and he had the hots for me. And I... He said to me, I want you to meet this guy. He wants to make movies just like you do. And he invited me to the house for brunch. And in walks Joel Schumacher. And it was like, hey. And we both didn't like each other at that point. Mm -hmm. And he was the kind of a head of a very hip world of uh, Stephen Burroughs and, mm. you know, very whole fashion sure. thing. And I was kind of like, I had a very established Edward Albee, Stephen Sondheim, Lenny Bernstein, Hal Prince. That was my... Kitty Hawks, that was my world. And we both were kind of opposite heads of different social circles, really, and didn't have much use for each other. And when he walked in and we started talking about making movies, and it was like the Liberty Bell fell on both our heads. And all day long, the Supremes' song, Here Comes the Sun, that album was playing. And it was a hot summer day in July, and we were both soaking in the sun, and we started talking about our dreams in Hollywood. And we decided that we were gonna go out to Hollywood together. And I started using him in my commercials. And then one day, he was doing a window at Bendel's, and he used to take these mannequins that were then like Donna Reed mannequins, and he would dip them in chocolate, in uh, coffee, various shades of coffee. Okay. And they came out as these multi-culti, multi-ethnic. This is 1968, 69 you're talking about. This was before Benetton. And Joel, he would twist these mannequins into these various shapes and put dresses on them, red dresses. And one day, and they used to be like events that he would do on Monday night. Every, all the whole fashion world would come down to yes. watch Joel do these windows. And there was a sequin on the floor. And I picked up the sequin. Joel just reminded me of the story the other day. I picked up the sequin off the floor, and I said, this is the movie that we're going to make. Look. And it sparkled. And I said, we're going to make a movie called Sparkle about three black girls in red dresses. That's what we're doing, and you're going to write it. <laughs> and eventually, <coughs> I met a man named Tommy Nutter, who was a designer of dresses and uh, coats. He, he designed piping on these jackets, and Mick Jagger and Bianca Jagger wore them. And, I don't know, I picked them up in some club somewhere and woke up. The next thing I knew, I woke up in this house at 135 Central Park West. And I was so drunk, I told Tommy the story of Sparkle. Well, little did I know that he was, his former lover was Peter Brown, who now represents the Crown of England, I might add, and Andrew Lloyd Webber. Tommy Nutter told the story to Peter Brown, and Peter Brown said, this is lovely. We must make this movie. And he gave us money, and we got a writer to write the, sc the script, Lonnie Elder, who had just written Sounder. Then the script came in, it was terrible, and I was still doing commercials. And then I went out to Hollywood. Oh, God, this is bringing back so much for me. My girlfriend, Kitty Hawks, was working for a man named Ron Bernstein. And Ron was working for Danny Melnick at David Susskind's. Kitty was his reader. And she brought back a manuscript one day. Uh, 
about a killer shark off the coast of Long Island. It was called Great White. Now, I had met Barry Diller, and Barry was, had just invented the movie of the week. And um, we got pretty friendly, and he said to me once, the greatest thing, I teach all my students this uh, when I teach, because um, he understood the nexus of friendship and exploitation in the movie business. And he said to me, you know, you're really smart. He said, I really need a good friend on the East Coast who knows a lot, uh, you know, about what's going on, you know, because he was traveling back and forth to the um, West Coast and East Coast. Uh, he was based out here. And he said, you know something, do me a favor. Don't ask me for anything. Don't ask me for any favors. When the time comes and you think you're ready, ask me for one thing, and I will do it, and then don't ask me for anything ever again. Five years went by. Kitty is now working for Ron Bernstein. I read the manuscript, and I said, this is it. And by this time, Barry was the head of the network. I call up Barry, and I say, the one favor. I read a manuscript. It's called Great White. It's about a killer shark off the coast of Long Island. I've got to make this movie. And he says, come out, and I'll introduce you to my 90, the head of my 90s. He introduced me to Dean Barkley, who had invented the careers of Steven Spielberg by giving him Duel, mm -hmm. by giving Michael Crichton his first movie. And eventually she gave me and Joel our first movies. But she got all excited about it. And we were going to take the outtakes from Blue Water, White Death, or that Peter Gimbel had made, a documentary. But when I went to buy them, to, 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 to try to buy the material, at the time, the 90s, the license fee was $425,000, and they would buy it for a two-run license fee, and then the production company had to pay the deficits. But they were paying $10,000 for basic material and $10,000 for a screenplay. And so when I went to make the offer to Roberta Pryor at ICM, I'll never forget this, at IFA, um, she said, well, we're looking for more than that. And then I went to the head of his 90s, and the head of his 90s, the head of his two-hour motion picture, the head of his two-hour, they were paying $75,000 for basic material and $75,000 for screenplay. And I said, oh my God, it's a $150,000 offer. You've got to take this. She said, we were looking for even more than that. Well, within two days, it was sold to Zanuck and Brown, for then unheard of price of <coughs> $400,000, and it became Jaws. It was Spielberg's first movie. And it was announced in the trades, and Mr. Diller called me up and said, you obviously know what the fuck you're doing. Excuse me, I'm, you know, you, you know, take any piece of shit, come out here, and I'm going to make it. And eventually, I teamed up with Ron Bernstein, and we brought a television movie that was called Isn't It Shocking, about a man that goes around killing people with an electrocardiograph machine. Yes. But we cast it very high-end, Ruth Gordon, um, Will Gear, Alan Alda, Louise Lasser. Um, it was a great cast. And Deanne Barkley made the movie, and I made the movie for the network. And um, it got very high ratings. And then um, Stigwood, who had by that time financed the funding of Sparkle, <coughs> wanted to open up an office out here, so he asked me to open up RSO Films, hmm. which I did. And then I introduced him to Mr. Diller. And I continued making television movies. I made um, All Together Now with Randall Kleiser. Then I made Virginia Hill that Joel Schumacher wrote and directed right. with Diane Cannon and Harvey Keitel. Oh, then I made Killer Bees, Miss Gloria Swanson. Yes. And uh, Kate Jackson and Eddie Albert. And Curtis Harrington did, the, did that. And Joel did the clothes uh, for that. John Badham directed it. Then I did another one, Death Scream, it was called, with Raul Julia. It was a backdoor pilot. Yes. And it was based on the Kitty Genovese story in New York. By this time, I really wanted to make Sparkle. And a Lonnie Elder script came in, and it wasn't good. And I said to Joel one day, you are the only one that could write this. And Joel wrote the screenplay. And eventually, I sold it to Warner Brothers. And I wanted Ashford and Simpson to do the music. I loved Ashford and Simpson, Ain't No Man High Enough, You're All I Need to Get By. Of course. All the great Motown songs. And I was in love with Ashford and Simpson. And I said, uh, Joel handed in a script that was 200 pages. I'll never forget this. And we went to see John Calley at Warner Brothers. And John Calley, who, who used to call me Rosenman del Oro, Rosenman of the Gold. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I was this flamboyant figure. <laughs> and he said, I'll tell you what, you use Curtis Mayfield to do the music and you make the movie for a million too. And uh, I remember taking a long walk around Warner Brothers with Joel. And um, I loved Ashford and Simpson so much I couldn't give it up. And Joel said, you idiot, don't you understand you can get a movie made with Curtis Mayfield? Curtis Mayfield is our Barbara Streisand. And eventually that's what happened. Curtis Mayfield did the soundtrack, Aretha did the uh, recording, Irene Cara, Philip Michael Thomas, Lynette McKee, all their first times. How did you feel about the movie when you were done with it? Joel's original conception was like, you know, this, this dynastic family situation. And we were thinking of a big, big movie. And it was a small, little movie. But I was happy because the performances were so wonderful. Yeah, some nice moments. The Net McKee was so beautiful in it. Yeah. You know, and I got my traction. I got my, it was my motor. It you was were the, a theatrical uh, I was movie happening. guy at that time. And I, after that, Kitty Hawks, I convinced her to come out here to become an agent. And she became my agent, and Joel's agent, and Stocker Channing's agent, and Tommy Lee Jones's agent. She had a client named Renee Missel. And I had this idea that I wanted to do a female Jesus story. And Renee had an idea about a woman that owned the contract of a boxer. We decided that we were going to make these two movies, the main event and Resurrection. And the main event, I had uh, met Nick Nolte in New York uh, through a man named Tom Hahn, and I put him in a lot of my commercials. He was a beautiful young man. He was man. very beautiful. And what had happened was that during the time, the interim time, he became a television star because he was in Rich Man, Poor Man right. with Susie Blakely. And I remember saying to myself, ah, the main event, we'll do it with Nick Nolte and Susie Blakely. And we attached them, okay? And we got a deal. Kitty got us a deal at MGM. Sherry Lansing was the development girl. Eventually, I was going to do it with Diana Ross and Ryan O'Neill. And then eventually, Michael Black was working with Sue Mangers at I ICM. And he strategized the whole thing. And he knew that Barbara Streisand had to be in principal photography by September 1st, 1978. Uh, First Artist was a company that was owned by Barbara Streisand, uh, Paul Newman, Dustin Hoffman, Sidney Poitier, and Steve McQueen. They each had to do five movies for First Artists. If she wasn't in principal photography by September 1st, 1978, Warner Brothers could have handed her any script and she would have had to have done it. And so I knew this information and Sue had just signed Diana Ross and I gave the script to Sue, Sue Mengers, the great agent. Sure. I gave the script to Sue as per Michael Black's instructions. I gave the script to Sue for her to read for Diana and Ryan. And Sue, brilliant agent that she was, said, this would be perfect for Miss Streisand. She said, how would you like your name above lights? How would Rosenman presents Barbara Streisand in the main event? Eventually it happened, and it wasn't quite the dream that I thought it would be, but um, uh, it got me started, really, on the big-time motion picture business. And, well, that, uh, the picture was a big deal. The picture was time. a very big deal, and it made a lot of money. Yeah. Um, keeps on paying me. Every time, every time I get into trouble financially, so my business manager calls me up and says, oh my God, the, the Barbara, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I get like, you know, money from Zimbabwe or from Zambia or from God knows where. Perfect. It's perfect. Now, how, how was the making of that picture? How was that experience? Uh, I was young and, and uh, headstrong. And I didn't really understand the ways of Hollywood. Barbara was the biggest star in the world, okay? And I felt that this was our idea. And... She was a bit of an interloper coming into well, your idea. But, the, but, but the, the reality is, is that I should have known better and stepped aside. I would have gotten my credit, I would have gotten my sure. thing. But at one time, John Peters and she, they were very arrogant about how they were handling the whole thing. And they oh, yes. wanted to have... They tried to have our price at the last minute, and mm. I turned the tables on them and doubled our price. And um, because I owned the material and they were already paying out money to Ryan O'Neill and to Howard Zeef, the director who just died. They just didn't want me around, naturally, and I should have accepted it with grace. I didn't. 
at the time. I was angry and I was, you, you know. No, but you're, you're, you were dealing with some pretty strong oh, people yeah. and you would have been steamrolled. When a movie like that is made, I had to get it and turn around from MGM, which is a whole other story, um, which Sue Mangus taught me how to do. I alienated the man who was running MGM, Dick Shepard, because she told me two facts about his life, and his name was really Shepard Tinsky, and he and his wife slept in separate bedrooms. And I remember saying, I want my movie back. I don't want you to make it. You're a man that's ashamed of being Jewish, and you and your wife sleep in separate bedrooms. You're a fucking artificial person. I want my movie back. And he was so angry at me that he gave it back. Meanwhile, I set it up at Warner Brothers the next day with Barbara Streisand headlining it, and he got fired <laughs> not soon after. But then they were there were so many companies involved. There was MGM, there was First Artist, there was Warner Brothers, there was J uh, the JPO, John Peters Organization, there was Barwood, Barbara Streisand's company, there was Rosamund Missile. And so they had it signed the instruments of transfer, and there were all these lawyers around the table, okay? And my lawyer, Norman Gary, may he rest in peace, calls me up and says, well, they're going to, my deal at the time, Renee and I's deal at the time was $400,000 and five points. And Barbara wanted to have the right, or Barbara's company wanted to have the right to put our name anywhere she wanted. Well, first that was the big fight. I wouldn't permit that. Okay. Then the second thing that happened was they wanted to cut our price in half. Mm -hmm. And I, my lawyer got on the phone and said, I said, can they do this? And he said, yeah, they can do anything they want. You know, they haven't signed the papers yet. You know, and, the, and it's a negotiation at this yeah. point. I said, but we negotiated the deal. He said, it's just too bad. They know your situation. They know you don't have money to fight this. I said, mm -hmm. really? Is that so? They know that. I said, will you tell John Peters to take that phone and shove it up his fucking ass? I said, okay. You tell them that in front of the assembled. He said, I can't say that. I said, I want you to tell, I want to hear you say that to that motherfucker. I want to hear you say that. John Peters gets on the phone, he says, you cocksucker. He says, you are crazy. He said, the only other person that produced a Barbra Streisand movie other than myself is Ray Stark. You'd be the only person in the world who would have his name on a Barbra Streisand picture. You're nuts. You belong in Camarillo, he says to me. I said, when you can pronounce the word Camarillo correctly, I'll have a conversation with you. I said, you graduated the Valley School of Hair Design, and I graduated college magna cum laude. I said, let me tell you something. You have taken my movie, your greedy venal girlfriend, you've made my movie hot, okay? I can now go to Jill Clayburgh, to Diane Keaton, to Diana Ross, and make my movie because you, my dear, have spent a million dollars for Ryan O'Neill and $25,000 for Howard Zeef, and I own the material. For a movie you don't own. So fuck you. At the close of business today, I'm gonna get from you $50,000 in cash Okay, our new price is six hundred thousand dollars, and we're getting seven and a half points. Bye bye now. <laughs> That's what happened. Close of business today. Needless to say, <laughs> I was not on the set. Right. You know, and it was a tough thing. I, you know, now I'm much older. I see things differently. You know, I, I've been in that situation a lot now. For ideas that I've invented. Well, when a big movie star comes and does it, it becomes theirs. And you have to learn how to say goodbye to it. Well, then you did Resurrection. Then I did Resurrection with Ellen Burstyn. Tell me about that and that experience. Well, that was a tremendous labor of love because um, I had been in Jerusalem to visit my parents. My parents moved back to Israel with my baby brother, and um, who was five. And I went to visit them every year, Christmas. This particular year, I was on the Via de la Rosa which is the Street of Tears. It's where Jesus sure. walked with the cross on his back. And the state, there were 13, 11 or 13 stations of the cross. It was a Christmas morning. There weren't many people in the old city. I was on the Via de la Rosa, and it was had this gray, crystalline day, a Jerusalem winter day. And um, I looked down. At like I was, I I think either I was at Veronica's Veil. I don't know which station I was at, but either six or seven. And I looked down at station eight, and I saw this woman with an aura around her. And I said to myself, "Wow, what if Jesus came back as a woman?" And when I went back to America, and Kitty was by now married to Ned Tannen, who was the head of Universal Pictures, 
and I had introduced them, and um, she we set it up, and I developed that screenplay uh, through several different writers, and eventually we got Louis Giancarlino to write the screenplay, and eventually I got Ellen Burstyn to do it. Ellen Burstyn was the Triple Crown winner that year. She won the Emmy, the Oscar, and the Tony. Ned Tannen, who was the head of the studio, said, said to me, if you get Ellen Burstyn, I'll make the movie. You know, and at the time he didn't want to pay for me and Renee going to uh, Greece. Ellen was filming a movie with Melina Mercury, uh, Medea, I think it was. And uh, we, uh, through a series of almost cosmic events, Ellen agreed, finally agreed to see us. Then all these coincidences happened that were very spiritual, which the movie was about, and um, she eventually agreed to do it, you know. And she uh, was nominated for the And Academy she was nominated Award. for an Oscar. And the greatest lesson that I ever learned was on that movie because Ellen and I were very close. Um, we literally rented a house together in Texas and slept in the same bed, you know, platonically. Sure. And um, we were very close. We ate lunch every day on the set together. And then something peculiar happened. On the Thursday night, we were supposed to be out of Texas that Friday night. On the Thursday night before, Ellen says to me, I'd like to see tomorrow's set. I said, okay. Paul Silbert was the production designer. It was a scene that was set in a bar, Ellen Burstyn and Sam Shepard. And um, he was explaining to her who he was, and she was explaining to him who she was. Um, and she had just had this near-death experience, which gave her the power of healing. Um, so... Uh, she walks in the bar, and we walk, I'm walking with her, we walk all the way to the end of the bar. She looks at something on the wall, and then she turns around and we leave the bar and we go into her Winnebago. And she says to me, I can't, we have to redo the set, we have to rebuild the set. So we have to rebuild the set, Why? what do you mean rebuild the set? She said, there was a, a sign there that said, no women allowed here. I said, oh, we'll, we'll take away the sign. She said, no, 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 the karma. We have to rebuild the set. I said, Ellen, I was a million dollars over. Ned Tannen was the head of the studio. I had introduced him to his wife, who I had been sleeping with just a couple of years before. It was a very delicate, sensitive right. situation. There's some things that, going on. <laughs> that Ellen knew. She knew. You know, mm. not as if she didn't know this. She knew it very, very well. My whole career was on the line because if we stayed over till Monday, we would have been in golden time and I would have been $3 million over on an $8 million movie, okay? So I say to Ellen, Ellen, we'll just, you, you understand this? She says, I can't shoot tomorrow, I'm not showing up for the set. The next morning comes and producers, by union rules, can't go and get actors. It's gotta be the UPM or the first AD, the unit production manager of the first AD. So, uh, Ellen wouldn't come out. And Ellen would come out, and Ellen would come out. And I got crazed. And I climbed on this tree, and I knocked on the window where I saw Ellen, and she closed the window shade. So I took a branch, and I broke the window, and jumped in, and grabbed her by the neck, and I said, you're coming to the set, bitch. You know? <laughs> and I said, my whole career is on the fucking line here. I said, you better come to the set. I'm not dealing with this bullshit. She came to the set. Again, needless to say, I didn't have lunch with Ellen that day. Right. And I figured I lost a friend for life. At the end of the day, she calls me into a Winnebago. She says to me, I have to apologize to you. She says, because if you learn one thing through this whole experience, she says, with the gift comes the other side. <laughs> mm. And I listened to her, and it was so profound what she was saying to me, because it was like, well, this is the way you have to treat talent. Yeah. Because with the gift comes the other side. When you have a really creative sort, it right. comes with all kinds of things. And if you can hold actors and directors and writers in that space of with the gift comes the other side, yes. and if you can go with it and nurture it and take care of it, you'll be a successful producer or a director. After I did Resurrection and the main event made so much money, it was like 1979 in New York. 1979 was The Saint, was Studio 54, was Fire Island, was The Hamptons, 
and I partied to a fare thee well. By the time my game was over, I was addicted to too many substances, 21 to be exact. And um, <clears throat> it was a very scary time. There was no test for it. Uh, I had a lactose intolerance that was undiagnosed. I thought for sure that I had the disease. I'm HIV negative, thank God, but I was probably wilder than any of my contemporaries. And so you, by, you, you were very fortunate. I was really fortunate. Not to become. I like, was really fortunate. God was sitting on my shoulder, let me tell you, because I was one Wilde Chaya, as they say. You were in very Yiddish. social. I was very social. <laughs> and I partook of all of it and had a blast. Um, but 1981, 82 were very, very dark years for me. And all my friends started to die left and right. Yes. And it was very scary and very humbling. And I was dying to get out of the muck and mire that I was in. And eventually, on January 18th, 1983, I surrendered and got sober and moved to Israel for six months to get away from everything, to be with my sister, and then came back to the States, uh, to New York, where I bought an apartment on uh, 9th Street and 3rd Avenue um, that my family co-opted. I didn't even have the money, the $6,000 that it took for the insider's price, because I was a blood relative. My cousins put it up for me. And um, I then had to rewend my way back to Hollywood. It was changed everything. It, you know, watching what changed everything was watching these brilliant young men die. Yeah. You know, and brutal deaths they were well, at the beginning. Well, you know, we have. I have many gay friends who lost everybody. No, all uh, of their friends died. Yeah, I lost everybody. Everybody. Hmm. Everybody. Um, I, I can't imagine. Just. I have two thousand two hundred and thirty-five friends that died of AIDS, and I die, and I have a list. And if I didn't keep the list, I would forget who they are. Sure. And um, You must have gone to a lot of funerals. At, I went through so many funerals and memorial services. It was every day in 1983, 84, 85. It was How every awful. day. It was the worst. And I was frightened to death. <laughs> and then uh, I decided to come back to Hollywood to do a movie, uh, a movie called uh, Lost Angels, which I did with Hugh Hudson. And that was a teenage cuckoo's nest, which was an idea of mine, because I felt that I was put into this one category, and nobody was going to let me out of it. And uh, at the time, it was about a middle-class kid being put into a mental institution, and he kills the head of the mental institution in order to get out. Donald Sutherland plays the head of the mental institution. Yes. Then David Geffen, who was, I was very close to at the time, said to me, I think you should work for Sandy Gallon. He has a company with Dolly Parton. It's not doing well you know, you can benefit from this and he could benefit from you. And David put us together and I went to work at Sand Dollar to co-head it. Now, was Sandy an agent or a Sandy's manager? Sandy's a manager. He's a manager. You have to understand that managers had a lot of leverage. I always worked for managers. Stigwood was a manager, Sandy was a manager, Brillstein Gray was a manager. Because what they have, they have a lot of clients. In Sandy's case, he had Michael Jackson, Neil Diamond, Dolly Parton, and at one point Richard Pryor, at one point Whoopi Goldberg, he had the Pointer Sisters. You did? A picture about that time called Tidy Endings. Mm -hmm. It was for HBO. Harvey Firestein wrote a play on Broadway that was in three acts called Safe Sex. And the third act was called Tidy Endings. And Tidy Endings was about a man that has just lost his lover. The lover had been married previously to a woman played by Stocker Channing. Harvey Firestein plays the lover. And the Stocker Channing and the dead lover have this 10-year-old child. And the point of the movie is, who is the real widow? Is it Stockard or is it Harvey Firestein? Mm -hmm. We sold it to Colin Callender at HBO, and it was the first thing that I did in my new incarnation. It's a very touching piece. Yeah, they won, really won Emmys and Ace Awards and Cable Ace they Awards. They won some and, Ace Awards, yeah, you know, four and, in all, and I, including for her. I was very proud of that. That was a case, again, <laughs> where... You was very patrician. He comes from the Balfour family, Lord Balfour, who actually created the document which made the modern state of Israel. And I was this kid from the streets of Brooklyn. And we didn't get along at all. And I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. And eventually he said to me, you know, this is my baby now. You know, and again, I'm, I was being co-opted of my own material, and I was freaking out. <laughs> and... Um, but I knew that I had to make it work with him. And so 
I invited him to the first time that the quilt appeared in North America was at the Pauley Pavilion. It was the size of a basketball court. That's how big the quilt was. And I was laying down four panels for my best friends. And it was a ritual. It was very beautiful. You see it at the beginning of the quilt movie. Yes. And so I said, the only way that he's going to respect me is if he sees me in a vulnerable position. And I went through the ritual, and I laid down the four panels, Peter Lester, Fernando Scarfiotti, Bruce Weintraub. And then my boyfriend, Tucker Ashworth, he was hanging from the eaves, his quilt, his panel. And at the end of it, I just collapsed on the floor crying. I just mm. couldn't take it. And suddenly I see from the bleachers, Hugh Hudson coming down. And he comes to me in the middle of the floor of the Pauley Pavilion. He takes me in his hands and he says to me, you've got to put your anger and your grief into something creative. You've got to make a movie about all of this. This is what you've got to do, he says to me. Hmm. And it was like, whoa, you know. And I'm suddenly looking at him and the bell's ringing. And from that moment and I, Hugh and I became like father and son. We are very, very bonded, okay? And I decide that I'm gonna make the quilt movie. And I call Bill Couturier, who had just done Letters from Vietnam, won an Oscar for it. Yes. And I say to Bill, I want you to direct this, about the quilt. He said, funnily enough, I'm talking to these guys, Rob and Epstein and uh, um, Jeff Friedman, yep. and they're interested in making a movie about the quilt. Why don't I put you two guys together? And that's how the quilt was born. My job on that movie was I got Dustin Hoffman to do the narration of that movie, who was an unassailable heterosexual who could comfort the people. And if he would do this, then it would mean something. Right. And what it did was it elevated the entire profile of the, of, of the well, it movie. Well, took it well beyond gay. Yeah, so, so yeah. that's what it, that was the most important thing. Not only with his narration, but with the stories that were told exactly. by him. Our purpose always, all, all of us, was to put a face on AIDS because all of us were going through such terrible times during that time. You know, we were now, by 1987 we were, right? Well, 85, 86, we were preparing all this. Right. And it was an amazing trip. And um, we won an Oscar and we won uh, a uh, Peabody, a George Foster Peabody Award. I, you know, I watched it the other day when I was working out on my treadmill, which I do every morning, and I started crying yeah. on the treadmill. You, well, can't, you can't make you can't, it through it. It's that just, little boy. Oh. oh. Boy. When he talks to Alf, you just want to wring your hands. It's a little too much. Yeah, it's just too but, much. But, you know, what a terrific accomplishment yeah. Yeah. to have done that. Staying on the subject of documentaries, uh, the Celluloid Closet. Celluloid out. Closet was born out of that. Vito, I knew for a long, long time, Vito Russo. Who... Now, Vito was one of the characters <laughs> yes. in Common and, Threads. Right. And, and amazingly articulate. Right. A bon vivant, interesting Brilliant. guy. But also an intellectual of the first order. And, yeah. and we knew each other from the early, early days when I first went out to Hollywood. Years later, after I made the main event, Vito was giving lectures that would eventually became the celluloid closet. And he yes. did them at the firehouse downtown in New York. And I used to see him a lot and go hear him speak. And I was just dazzled at his... At, at his I saw one of his yeah, speeches really? there. Oh, yeah. So you know. And he, he was... He was and, he, and people didn't want him to stop. Right. He was dazzling. And then, of course, uh, in 1979, there was a club called The Saint that I would go to of a Saturday night at 2 a.m. in the morning and stay there till 9 and then go to the baths at the St. Mark's, uh, Mark's Baths, which was around the corner owned by the same people. And Vito was in the kitchen, literally making the breakfasts for the, cus the customers. Sure. And I had this ritual going on with him. I would come down from wherever I was at the baths at around 10 o'clock in the morning, and he would make a triple decker tuna fish and egg salad on white toast with tomatoes no lettuce, <coughs> Sounds and good. french fries, and a malted, and he would give them to me. He would be smoking a thousand cigarettes, and all we'd do was talk about Hollywood, and all we'd do was talk about his thing, and we became very, very close. So that by the time I was doing the quilt movie, we were very close friends, mm. and then when HBO took us on the, um, we showed the movie for the House of Representatives in the Senate in Washington 
on that trip, Vito was very sick already. Mm -hmm. And Vito said to me, took my hand in the back of a limousine, and said, you've got to get this on the cellular closet. You've got to promise me. And he, he extracted the same promises from Rob and Jeff. And we decided that we would dev there was come hell or high water, we were going to make this movie. And on that movie, I had a lot more to do. Because on that movie, we had to get clips. And for nothing. Well, and you were the guy who knew everyone. And what happened was, it took me a year to go through the bureaucracy, and nothing happened. My secretary kept on calling every day, and nothing happened. And then one day, a year later, I'll never forget this, I got so angry. And I said, you know, I know all these guys. I grew up with them. And I made a list of all the guys that I knew. I started with Sid Scheinberg. I went to Mike Medavoy. I went to Barry Diller. And I made a list of the 10 guys. And I wrote it down on a paper. And I called up Sid Scheinberg, and I said, Sid, I need, you know, 20 clips that you have you know, my friends are all dropping dead of AIDS. A lot of this money is going to go to charity. I need this. I need you, Sid, to give these clips to me and for nothing. And he said, okay. Wow. <laughs> I said to myself, really? And then I called up Mike Medivore. <laughs> and I called up Mike. I said, I just spoke to Sid. And Sid told me that he was giving me all the clips and for nothing. I need you to give me the same thing. Because all my friends are dying of AIDS, and I need this money to go to charity. I need you to do this. He said, OK. And it took me half an hour to get all the clips, $3 million worth of clips, like that. It's one of the best. Yeah, and it's... not only because of what it says, but also how entertaining it is. Oh, it's so How interesting. Yeah. Paragraph 175. That I also helped with. A fascinating documentary you know, of what, what went on in the Third Reich and in that area generally with uh, the gay, primarily men, but some women of that era. Yeah. And it was so interesting to listen to the interviews with the aging gay men and to see, in some cases, how sad they were, in other cases, angry, in other cases, you know, just reminiscing about what their life was like. And <sighs> I was surprised by how open many of them were. I'm sure some were, you know, nervous and didn't want to talk, but uh, yeah. uh, the the candor was really impressive for these men who, yeah. you know, they come from a different time and place. Boy, do they ever! Yeah. And they're Germans too, and you know, in, in the main, except for those that were Polish or otherwise. And Germans, you know, I'm, I'm German by background, and there's. Uh, there's a ten tendency to be taciturn and not mm -hmm. talk about these mm -hmm. things. But these, these men were very forthcoming. Well, Rob and Jeff lives. are tremendously empathetic uh, interviewers. And they must they were be. Able, yeah, they were able to get the best from everybody on, on everything they do. Uh, Howard, you've, ta you've touched a little bit on some of the, uh, what, I, what I call kind of your, your middle theatricals, the movies that were sort of in the uh, uh, early 1990s. And you were incredibly prolific, uh, you know, amazingly so, for particularly given the fact that these are studio pictures mm -hmm. trying to make it through development hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure how you did that. Uh, <laughs> in, you've got uh, True Identity uh, in 91, Father of the Bride in 91, Shining Through and Straight Talk, A Stranger Among Us, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, all in that 92, 93 era. That may be almost unprecedented to have had that many movies in that period of time. Let's start with uh, True Identity. That was uh, a little bit of a departure for you from your, uh, I, I guess there is no normal H Howard Rosenbaum picture. You've done so many different types, but what, how did that come about? That was a script uh, that Carol Baum uh, developed at Sand Dollar that um, I came in and through my relationship with Jeffrey Katzenberg, we were able to get it on. And then uh, one of the, my favorite pictures in your group, Father of the Bride. I was obsessed with Elizabeth Taylor as a child. I was obsessed by her beauty. And uh, in fact, I went to the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature in the New York Public Library and under, Elizabeth, under Taylor Elizabeth, cut out every single picture of every single magazine that ever was and pasted it on my walls on Far Rockaway. And then I snuck into the premiere of Cleopatra 
And then I snuck into the back of the dressing room of the Lundfontein Theater where Richard was doing Hamlet and made Richard think that I was the producer's assistant and the producers thought I was Richard's assistant and eventually I was working for Richard and my job. How do you do that? <laughs> you have to have a lot of chutzpah. Yeah, I, I, I would never be able to do that. I, I couldn't I, do it now. I, I would be too respectful of these. I couldn't do it now, but I was so desperate. To Elizabeth was so beautiful and so gorgeous and I still wanted to be part of it. Yes. And eventually I became <coughs> friendly with them and... Um, Elizabeth, years later, helped me fund Project Angel Food, um, and she helped me fund the Elizabeth Taylor Green Room, a project uh, that I uh, built at uh, Cedar Sinai for. Would you mind segueing and talking about those two projects? I th those are the Elizabeth Taylor Green Room came out of my association with LifeSpring, where you learn about commitment and time and um, how to give back and uh, teamwork and. Um, at the time, LifeSpring was only doing projects that were devoted to homeless people. But the AIDS uh, the epidemic was fulminant at that time. And what would happen was that parents would be called from Venezuela or from Rome to find out in one minute that their sons were gay and that they were going to die in the hallways of these hospitals. Mm. And there was no place for a doctor to have privacy and a sacredness to tell the parents what the situation was so that they could catch their breath. And there was no place for these young men to sit and browse books or watch television. And I was determined with my LifeSpring group to create a room so that they can have this space. And I called it the Elizabeth Taylor Green Room. And I went to Elizabeth <coughs> and got the money and we built the room at Cedar sinai mm. And then out of that, um, Mary Ann Williamson, who was then uh, doing an exegesis in the Course of Miracles every Saturday, uh, 1985 this was, where she was, um, it was called a Handsome Boys Religion, HBR, because there were all these young men that were going to listen to her talk. And she talked in our lingo, in our conversation. She experienced the same things we experienced, and yet she was bringing a spiritual perspective. And uh, she had a, 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 a project called the Center for Living, which is essentially holistic stuff for AIDS sufferers. And uh, I went to New York one day, and I saw a little charity box that said, God's Love We Deliver. And on the bottom it said Ganja Stone, who was the executive director of it. And I decided to go meet her. And she had this Meals on Wheels for gay people. And I came back from New York, and I said to Marianne, I know just what we can do. Under the headline of the Center for Living, we could have a separate entity called Project Angel Food, which would be a Meals on Wheels for gay people just like God's Lovely Deliver. And there were 10 of us that were involved in the mm -hmm. making of that. And it's now one of the biggest uh, charities yeah. in Southern California. Well, uh, what a nice contribution. What a, what a nice thing Thank to you. do. Um, getting back to the movies, Father of the Bride. How were you able to put that one together? Cindy Williams came to Carol's office one day and said that she wanted to do a remake of Father of the Bride for Jack Nicholson to star in. Okay. And she called me into the office. Carol knew about my obsession with Elizabeth Taylor. And when she told me this thing, I said, I have got to make an Elizabeth Taylor remake. And eventually, we got TriStar to buy it. Jeff Sagansky bought it for us, and, um, or optioned it for us. But at the time, they only optioned the motion picture rights, none of the other rights. Then. We got it out of TriStar and got it over to Jeffrey Katzenberg at Disney. But in order to make the deal work, we had to have a check in Ted Turner's hands for $150,000 by the close of business that Friday, or else we would have lost the rights. And the lawyer for the sand dollar at the time said, I can't authorize this. I'm not, I'm not going to do this, you know, right. because who knows whether we'll be able to sell it. And I took out my checkbook and I wrote a check for $150,000. Now, did you have $150,000? I had minus $150,000 in my I bank see. So, so you, you were trying to bridge this. Yeah, I was trying to bridge it. And I wrote that check and I sent it over. And I called Jeffrey and I said, I just sent over a check for $150,000. And he said, Congratulations, you're finally a producer. Yeah. You've got big balls, Rosenman. We're going to cover you. And that's how Father of the Bride happened. 
And the great other story about Father of the Bride is that uh, James Orr and Jim Cruikshank wrote the first draft. And it was a very masculine draft. Um, but they had created this character of Frank, which was brilliant. Yes. And uh, they, they put that into the writing? That was in the writing. Now, yes, exactly. Wow. As, as it was. And then but, Nan That's an impressive creation. It's an impressive creation. And then Nancy Meyer and Chuck Shire um, came on board to rewrite it. Jeffrey Katzenberg brought them on. And they wanted to remove the character of Frank. But they wanted Diane Keaton to be in it. At the time, Diane Keaton was box office poison. And I made a deal with them, and I said, I'll convince Jeffrey to go with Diane if you keep the character of Frank. You then did two interesting pictures with Melanie Griffith. Yes. Uh, Shining Through and uh, A Stranger Among Us. Right. I loved Something Wild, okay, uh, which is she, she, the Jonathan Demme movie that she yes. was in. Shining Through, we originally went to Deborah Winger, but Deborah Winger's lawyer at the time wouldn't make a deal with us. And eventually we brought in David Seltzer on to write the screenplay, and then Melanie Griffith. And Michael Douglas, we also were able to get because I think he wanted to work with Melanie Griffith. Now, that is a very traditional Hollywood movie. Very traditional. And you know. um, the kind of thing that you didn't see that much of, although you saw more of it in the 90s than you had seen for the previous two decades, I think. It was very unusual for its time period, and the fact that Odorn allowed us to make it such an old-fashioned movie. A Stranger Among Us, also with Melanie Griffith, and now, now you're dealing with a subject matter that has, you have some affinity for, right. or at least some knowledge of. Right, and it was my idea. Uh, I did it out of, out of a respect to my sister, to show her way of life. It was a little more old-fashioned than I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the Hasidic communities that I wanted were a little more evolved, and, but Sidney Lumet was very old school, and he wanted it his way, the music, and you know, he got Harnack and Bach to write the music, um, who wrote Fiddler on the Roof. Um, uh, I wanted it to be a little bit more uh, hipper and more modern. In between, you did uh, Straight Talk with Dolly Parton and James Woods. Dolly yes. Parton was essentially our boss. I mean, she wasn't really, but... She is uh, a force of nature, isn't she? She's the best. She's the greatest. It's the reason that I went to work for Sandal. And she's a doll. She's just a doll. She's just a fabulous woman. Isn't that nice? Yeah, fabulous. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. That was a script that was brought to me uh, by Chris Harbert at UTA at the time, that Joss Whedon wrote. Um, I fell in love with the writing. Nobody in my company wanted to make it, but I was relentless about it. And eventually I got a Japanese guy to put up money for it, and his wife had directed one picture, and I foolishly let her direct it. She was a terrible director, and she's a terrible woman. And, um, but it was the only way that I could have gotten it off at the time. But, you know, it is such a mess <laughs> that it kind of works well, on its own level. But it wasn't what Joss wanted. My one big disappointment in my life is that I knew what Joss wanted and I knew this wasn't it. And eventually right. he did the TV show and that was more of what I had originally envisioned. But I, again, I... Well, and that really worked. Yeah, and that really worked. Became like gangbusters. part of the yeah. Zeitist. I made uh, Family Man in 2000, but I made uh, a series of independents, You Kill Me with Ben Kingsley and Taylor Leone, and My First Mister I made, and then I made Noel, Chaz Palminteri directed, and then Breakfast with Scott, which, which you guys bought. We are uh, distributing, right. and uh, you know, a really enjoyable movie. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. and. Uh, unusual film with, uh, you know, two rather uh, strong and silent gay guys who <laughs> inherit this child who is kind of over the top <laughs> something. And uh, as I understand it, perhaps the first movie actually which enabled you to use the uh, National Hockey League insignia on a film that had gay content. We not only used, we used the arena, we used all their clothes, we used all their logos. They were very, very hip about the whole thing. Well, yeah. uh, I guess uh, they're largely Canadian, and Canadians are a little more open. I'd like to do a things. series based on this, if I can. John from Cincinnati. You know, big deal on HBO. Uh, a very mysterious series. Uh, I had not 
watched it when it was on. I watched it on DVD and parts of it I was confused by and parts of it I really loved. Uh, Bruce Weber is one of my closest friends, is like my family. And he was very close to this family of um, uh, surfers that I got uh, close to. Um, Herbie Fletcher is the king of surfers. And his wife's father was the king of surfers. And it's a whole surfing family. And they had two kids, Nathan and Christian. Christian Fletcher became the first surfer that, like, put a 69 in his head and, you know, was a wild up until that point, it was all very, very kind of like uh, preppy, but he kind of changed the nature of the medium. And I thought that the family story was interesting. Yep. And I wanted to do essentially six feet under in the world of surfing. I brought the family to Ari Emanuel at Endeavor. He brought them to Carolyn uh, Strauss at HBO. She called me and said, you want the good news or the bad news? I said, give me the good news first. She said, David Milch. Is gonna wants to do this. David Milch was the biggest name in television at the time. Sure. And I said the bad news: David Milch is gonna do this. Uh, he is not gonna accept your notes, she said to me. And then she said to me, he doesn't accept my notes. So what she was saying to me was, again, your baby, you're gonna have to walk away from it. Are you willing to do this? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and again, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do that. And um, I made a mistake. You know. Well, it got made um, a very curious piece. Very curious piece. On several levels. It could have been brilliant, but... And David Milch is brilliant, uh, I must say. Yes. But <coughs> he tried... Listen, this is the nature of creativity. you got to let them swing it, and sometimes they miss and sometimes they hit. You know. Well, and very recently, uh, you acted again <laughs> in uh, the much-honored Milk which uh, was clearly one of the best films of this last year and with two uh, Academy Awards uh, and you played the then owner of The Advocate <laughs> which ironically I now own. <laughs> so it's, it's a very small and circular and weird <laughs> world <laughs> in, in that regard. But brilliant performance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, you got to act with some uh, really good actors. And um, what, what did you think of the speeches by Dustin Lance Black and by Sean Penn at the Academy Awards? Well, the Dustin Lance Black speech just slayed me. I mean, have you ever seen anybody with such grace and such no. passion and such empathy and such, and such an attractive guy? I mean that that is our role model for young gay people. Can you imagine that? All over the world, a billion people are watching them. A hundred million are gay. And they're watching this gorgeous man, this stunningly beautiful, brilliant guy telling them that it's okay for them to be gay. It's more brilliant than any advertising you can get from anything. It, it, you was, know. it was a historic moment. It, it, oh, and gigantic. I, I was there with my daughter, and I, I, said you, I said to her after that speech, she was in tears. Yeah, I mean... And I said um, that that's history. No, was, because that that's now been put out there, such very history. clearly and so articulately. So articulately and so beautifully said. And then Sean coming in and making that joke, and then Sean Penn, who is an unassailably straight, saying to the world, "Shame on you, you people that voted for Proposition Eight. Shame on you. Your grandparents are gonna, your grandchildren are gonna, yes. are gonna be ashamed of you." That straight guy, that fabulous man, said that uh, in an admonitory way to the people that, 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 that are trying to take our rights. You want to love this man, you want to love forever. This is a saint. Yeah. I don't care what his life is like. I don't care what his politics are like. This is a great guy. You know, this is a guy that stand, both him and Dustin Lance, like and Gus Van Zandt, they, they say it and they do it. Those are my kind of guys. Yeah, the, you know, I was really so are. proud to be part of that. You have no idea. It changed my life, transformed my life totally. It certainly gives one encouragement, yes. doesn't it, that there yes. are people of ah. conviction and courage. And Sean, arguably the best actor, not even arguably, inarguably, the best actor of our generation. Well, I mean, you know. He deserved the award. Yeah. I mean, he disappeared you know, into, into that the role. role completely.
you know, as a producer, I'm not afraid of anything. I've done it all, and yes. there's nothing that can intimidate me anymore. And um, I was gliding on the kind of exhilaration of getting the part, you know, when I got the part. And then I was there <coughs> on the set the first day in costume with my hair blow drying and wearing right. my bling and my whole suit. And then Sean comes. And for the first time in my life, since I was a kid, I got petrified, but truly petrified. And I said to myself, what am I doing here? I mean, he's never going to be... I, I, this is not going to work. This is, can't work. He's going to throw me, he's going to say to Gus, get rid of this guy. He can't act his way out of a paper bag. And Sean looks in my, my, in my eyes, and he sees the fear and the terror in my eyes. He sees it. And he says to me, I don't want you to worry about a thing, Howard. He says, you know, I've never played gay before. You're going to help me. I'm going to help you. You have my back. I have your back. And we're going to get through this together. Mm. And it was like... Whoa, how generous, yes. you know, it was like he totally set me at ease and then Gus came over to me and totally set me at ease and it was a ball. I just had a blast doing it, working with such great actors, such commitment. I don't know, there's one moment in, in, in the scene, it's after he's, it's during the party and the Sylvester character comes down and goes up to him and you see him, Sean Penn, grabbing the Sylvester character and he's dancing, you know, and he got it. You know, he got what it's like to be a gay guy without being effeminate. He got a gay guy that was masculine, that was committed to the role, and he got every aspect of it, the gentleness of it, the mischievousness of it, the, you know, the way two lovers act with each other, running around the room throwing stuff at each other. You know, it's just so tender and so delicious. You know, you never see that. You've never seen that ever. I haven't. No. no it's, it's, you know. it's wonderful. Yeah. It, it's it's going to be, I'm sure, a source of great pride for you the rest of your yeah. life to have oh, it yeah. associated with that yeah. and then a major part oh, it's of it. The, it's one of the best things that I've ever done, it, you know, for sure. What are you developing now and <laughs> what are you working on that's of interest to you? I am developing several things at the studios. One is called American Erotic. It's a sex comedy that I've been developing for many years that Ashton Kutcher is attached to. Mm. Um, one is called, uh, then I'm doing a thing called Cat and Mouse at um, uh, Fox, uh, American Erotic is at Columbia. Cat and Mouse is a Tom and Jerry cartoon come to life, essentially. Then I'm doing the, how the Israeli Air Force was formed that I'm doing with Dave Ellison. It was a project that I developed with Zemeckis and Spielberg, these two bumbling guys who get in over the heads of Americans who have to steal the Messerschmitts from Prague that were built by Jewish slave labor, 25 Messerschmitts, 35 Messerschmitts and they still had their Nazi insignias on them. So because they were built by Jewish slave labor, they've got to be sabotaged. So they've got to be taken apart, put back together. They have to learn how to fly them. And then they fly them to Palestine, where there's a 10,000 Egyptian man column advancing on Tel Aviv. And the last act is an aerial battle between these Messerschmitts with Jewish stars painted over the Nazi insignias, piloted by Americans and Canadians and some Israelis, against these Spitfires that are piloted by Arabs and ex-Nazis. And so we're doing that. And then I'm doing um, Napoleon, his exile in St. Helena with Al Pacino. Mm. And John Curran, who directed The Painted Veil, is going to direct that. Oh. It's being rewritten right that now. That sounds great. And that's very exciting. And I'm doing a little indie called Jonah, which is based on the Ted Haggard story. What advice do you give to people who want to do some of the things you have done and want to try? This isn't rocket science. You know, this isn't real, the study of cancer. This is how to tell a story and put the elements together. Hollywood is about 99.999% rejection. And so if you keep at it, if you are tenacious, you will get it on, okay? And if you are in love with your material and you're passionate about your idea, that will keep you sustained during the periods of, of, of soul searching when you're thinking that the world's against you. Yes. You just have to keep on going and get up, brush yourself off, keep on walking, you fall down, you get up, brush yourself off, you keep on walking, you get up. You know, it's not rocket science. It's all about tenacity. It's all about having a clear idea of what you want to do and sticking to it. And <coughs> if you want total control, you know, you have to be a director, not a producer, you know. So if you are one of those people that needs total control, make sure that you go into the right field, that you become a director, not a producer. Because the producer 
once the director gets a hold of it, it's not yours anymore. You know, there are very few producers that have their mark. Sure. Bruckheimer is one of the only ones right now that, mm -hmm. that, that has that kind of power. Maybe Scott Rudin. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, you know, I think what you're saying is never give up. Exactly. Just keep at it. They exactly. can throw you out of the office, but just keep coming back. Exactly. Howard, thank you very much for spending this time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for being so kind. Mm -hmm.